Okay guys, hello. So we are at chapter 5, Turning Effect of Forces and today we want to talk in more detail with regards to the principle of moment. Alright, so at the end of this section, you should be able to state the principle of moments for a body in equilibrium. Use the principle of moments to actually solve associated problems. Okay, so firstly, what is the principle of moments? You have already explored the principle of moment in the previous um, exercise. So the principle of moment states that when a body is in equilibrium, in equilibrium means that the body is balanced. Okay, it means that the body is not moving. Um, and so when that happens, the sum of clockwise moments about a pivot is equal to the sum of anti-clockwise moments about the same pivot. Okay, so what does that mean, right? So let's take a look at this example over here. Okay, let's take a look at all the forces that will give you your clockwise moment. So you see your 4 Newton force over here is acting downward. So this will contribute to a clockwise moment acting on the pivot P over here. Likewise, your 1 Newton over here will have a downward force which will contribute to a clockwise moment acting about the pivot. So now if I want to solve for A, to find the sum of all my clockwise moment, then what I will need to do is I will need to actually take, right? I will need to actually take my 4 Newton and I need to multiply it by 15 cm. Why do I take the Newton multiplied by the centimeters? Okay, why do I take the force multiplied by distance? Because moment, if we can remember, is given as the force multiplied by the perpendicular distance, right? Okay, alright, so this is only the clockwise moment from the 4 Newton force. What about the clockwise new clockwise moment from the 1 Newton force? So I have to add that in as well, plus 1 Newton multiply. Alright, so now over here, this is the tricky bit. Remember when we say the perpendicular distance, it is the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the force all the way to the pivot. Okay, from the force all the way to the pivot. Okay, so what it means simply is that when you multiply the distance to the pivot, it should be this whole thing over here. Right, so it should be 15 plus 25 cm, which will give you 40 cm. So your clockwise moment, okay, your sum of your clockwise moments will be 60 Newton centimeters plus 40 Newton centimeters to give you 100 Newton centimeters. Okay, right, so that will be your um, sum of your clockwise moments, which we already have found for A. Okay, now for part B, in order to find the unknown weight W, right? So since we say that this figure is balanced, we say that this object must be in equilibrium. Okay, equilibrium will mean that the object is balanced, right? So in order for the object to be in equilibrium, therefore, the sum of my clockwise moments, okay, I'm going to use CW as my short form, must be equals to the sum of my anti-clockwise moment. Okay, so I will use it. I will use ACW as the short form for my anti-clockwise moment. So the sum of my clockwise moments I've already found out. It is hundred newton centimeters. Okay, so what about my anti-clockwise moment? You realize that the anti-clockwise moment is due to the weight W over here. Right, which contributes to the anti-clockwise moment about the pivot over here. So the sum of anti-clockwise moments is W multiplied by 20 centimeters, right? Why do we take this? Because the moment is given by the force times the perpendicular distance to the pivot. So now to solve for W, I simply take um, 100 divided by 20 equals to W. And you will get your W to be equals to 5 newtons, right? So that's your answer. Okay, there you go. Alright, so now let's take a look at the next slide, right? So at the next slide, okay, what we have is we want to have an example where a builder uses the wheelbarrow to move a load of brick weighing about 500 newtons, right?
So if you want to balance this wheelbarrow, right, where should your force be applied? So your force will be applied upwards like this, right? So this is the force that you are going to apply to ensure that this wheelbarrow remains balanced. And in order for this wheelbarrow to be balanced, what did we say? We say that the sum of your clockwise moments must be equal to the sum of your anti-clockwise moment. Okay, so I'm just going to write short form first. Okay, clockwise moments equal to anti-clockwise moment. But you know that when I say clockwise moments, it refers to the sum of the clockwise moment. Okay, sum of anti-clockwise moment. Okay, now, so let's take a look at this wheelbarrow over here. So, where is the pivot? Where is this object turning about? Where is the point where this object is being supported? Right? So, this is the point where you are supporting the object at. Right? And this is the point where the object is turning about. So, this will be the pivot. Right? So, now, after we've identified the pivot, and we've identified all the forces acting on the object, which is the load and the outward force. Let's try to identify the clockwise moments and the anti-clockwise moment. So the clockwise moments will be due to your 500 Newton load over here, right? So how do you know that? Because the downward force contributes to a turning effect in the clockwise direction. Whereas for the F over here, the upward force contributes to an anti-clockwise um, moment or turning effect, right? Okay, so now to calculate the clockwise moment, let's take the force, which is the 500 Newton, multiply by the distance to the pivot. So the distance to the pivot is here. This is 0 0.4 meters. And to find for the anti-clockwise moment, let's take the force F, right? This force F and multiply it by the distance to the Pivot. So this distance is 1 meters. Right? Okay. So when you want to find for your F and you will take your 500 times 0 0.4, you will get a value of 200 Newton meters. And this is equals to F um, times 1. Right? And therefore your F is equals to 200 Newton. Alright? Okay, right, so we've mentioned um, a few times, right, in order for an object to be in equilibrium, the sum of clockwise moments must be equal to the sum of anti-clockwise moment. All right, so what are the conditions for an object to be in equilibrium? Okay, so we learned that a system is in equilibrium also means that it has no net force acting on it. So the forces acting in the system are balanced. Apart from that, in this chapter, we also add in another condition. For a system to be in equilibrium, the resultant moment about any pivot is also zero. Right? And we can use the principle of moments and the concept of balance forces to check for equilibrium. Okay, so simply mean, simply mean, okay, so, um, two things need to um, be checked. Okay, um, two conditions need to be checked. Okay, number one, we say that there is no net or resultant force acting on the object okay so there's no net force or no net force or resultant force acting on the object okay so which means if you have a beam like that right okay if you have a beam like that the total uh, downward force the total upward force acting on the beam must all be equal right so the beam is not moving number two we say that there is no resultant moment which means that we are saying that the sum of your clockwise moment okay the sum of your clockwise moments must be equals to the sum of your anti-clockwise moment right so let's go on okay so when you have multiple moments in a system in equilibrium the principle of moment states that for a system to be in equilibrium the sum of the clockwise moments is equal to the sum of the anti-clockwise moments, right? So why do we say sum? Because sometimes there are more than two forces in a system. We just need to remember that there are only two directions of moment, either clockwise or anti-clockwise moment. Okay, of course, there can be times where there are no moments at, at all, right? So an example of that will be when you have a beam and then it is balanced on a pivot Right, and you don't have any clockwise nor anti-clockwise moment acting on this beam. 
Alright, so let's take a look at this example. Okay, so we want to find what is the sum of all the clockwise moment acting on the object or acting on the beam. Okay, so first let's identify all the forces acting on the object which will give you a clockwise moment. So let's take a look, the 10 Newton force over here. In which direction will it cause the beam to turn? It will cause the beam to turn in this direction. Right? So we will consider this a clockwise moment. What about the 5 Newton force? Same, it will cause the beam to turn in this direction, so it will be considered a clockwise moment. Right? What about the 2 Newton force? It will be in the opposite direction, so it will be in the anti-clockwise uh, direction. And the 8 Newton force will also contribute to an anti-clockwise moment. Okay? So if you want to find the sum of all the clockwise moment, okay, so sum of clockwise moment, you will take your 10 newtons multiplied by 0 0.6 meters plus 5 newton multiplied by, what's the distance again? Okay, so remember it's not 0 0.4 because you need to find the distance from the force to the pivot, right? So 0 0.6 plus 0 0.4 is equals to 1 meter. Okay, so this will be equals to 1 meter. Okay, so what you will get is, sorry. Okay, so what you will get is, you are, you are going to get um, 6 newton meters plus 5 newton meters and you will get an answer of 11 newton meters. Okay, okay, let's take a look. What about B, the sum of all your anti-clockwise moments? So, what is the sum of all your anti-clockwise moment? So, the sum of all your anti-clockwise moments will be equals to your 2 newton multiply by 0 0.5 meters plus, what about this one over here? 8 newtons. You have to multiply it with 1 meter again, right? Because you need to add the 0 0.5 meters together because when you're talking about the perpendicular distance, it is the perpendicular distance from the force to the pivot. Okay, so times 1 meters. So this will give you a value of um, 1 newton meter plus 8 newton meter and this will be equal to 9 newton meters. Alright, so now we are asked, what is the net moment? Okay, so the net moment simply means if there is more uh, moments in one direction um, and then you just have to minus them off to give you your net moment, right? So the net moment over here will be 11 newton meter, which is in your clockwise direction, right? Clockwise moment, 11 newton meter minus your 9 newton meters, your 9 newton meters, which is in the anti-clockwise direction to give you 2 newton meters. So these 2 newton meters, um, these 2 newton meters, will it be at the clockwise direction or the anti-clockwise direction? Right? So you can see that it should be in the clockwise direction because, okay, because the sum of the clockwise moment is more than the sum of the anti-clockwise moment. So part D, okay, is this beam balanced? The answer is no, right? If not, in which direction will it turn it? You know the answer already, right? So it will turn in the clockwise direction like that. Alright. Okay, right. So the next example, um, now we know that the system is in equilibrium. Okay, so it means that it is balanced, right? So we know that the sum of the clockwise moments must be equal to the sum of the anti-clockwise moment, right? Okay, so I want you to try this on your own. Okay, so I won't give you the working. I will just share with you that the answer is actually supposed to be 6.5 Newton. Okay, for your value of F over here. Alright, okay, so go and try it on your own and then see whether you can get the answer or not. Okay, now, um, and then, and then uh, what about this finally, right? Okay, you want to find the force R exerted by the pivot on the beam. Now, you realize that this force over here, the R over here, is due to the force of the pivot pressing on the beam. You see, without this pivot, uh, okay, the beam is just going to drop down, right? So, the beam is going to drop down because of the weight of the beam, because of the 
4 newton, 6 newton, and 9.5 newton forces acting downward. So this pivot is actually supporting the beam and preventing it from dropping down. So definitely there must be an upward force which the pivot is acting on the beam. So this force we shall label it as R. So to find this force R over here, it is simply by taking a look at what we understand by conditions of equilibrium, right? So in order for the beam to remain balanced, right, the sum of clockwise moments must be equal to the sum of anti-clockwise moment. Okay, over and on top of that, the total downward force acting on the beam must be equal to the total upward force acting on the beam. So R over here, right, so let me write down, okay, total downward force acting on the beam must be equal to the total upward force acting on the beam, right? So the total downward force will be 9.5 plus 6 plus 4 and your total upward force will be R, right? And so your R will be equal to 19.5 Newton, right? Now, in most cases, right, why do we ignore the force due to the pivot, right? In most cases, why do we ignore the force due to the pivot, right? You see, like the previous example over here, we don't say anything about the force R over here, but you know that there is a force there, right? So, why do we ignore that, okay? Because in most cases, or rather in most of the cases, this force R is acting um, directly onto the pivot like that, right? So if it's acting directly onto the pivot, then that means this force R does not contribute to any moment. So if it doesn't contribute to any moment, then we don't need to include it in our calculation for moment in order to um, establish or determine okay, the clockwise or anti-clockwise moment. Alright, Ken? Okay, so I hope uh, you understand this portion of the topic. Right? If there's any problems or issues, you can always... Uh, uh, email or WhatsApp us. All right. Okay, right. So next we have another example over here. Okay, but this time around, I'm not going to go through the answer with you. Um, can you just try it on your own and see whether or not you are able to get the answer? I'll just share with you, okay, that for the value of F that you should get, your answer should be 9.5 Newton. All right. So please try it on your own and see whether you are able to get this all right now so let's say for example now we have the similar question uh, as the work example just now but now i want to find the r over here okay so what is the r over here now you do notice or you do realize that when the beam is actually um when the beam is actually being supported by this pivot over here this pivot is actually um, applying an upward force acting on the beam over here because without this upward force, the beam will actually just go downwards. But normally, we do not include this force in our calculation for moment. Why do we not include this force in our calculation for moments? Because R is acting directly on the pivot, right? So R is acting directly on the pivot. So if R is acting directly on the pivot, then what does that mean? That means that there is zero perpendicular distance or there is zero meters of perpendicular distance from r to the pivot so which also means that r does not contribute to a turning effect about the pivot right because there is no perpendicular distance from r to the pivot so r does not contribute to the turning effect about the pivot right so normally in our calculation for a moment we normally ignore this force but now the question is asking you what is the force r over here so to do that we do realize that this beam is in equilibrium right so if it's in equilibrium then we know that there are two things or two conditions that it must satisfy number one 
the sum of the clockwise moments must be equal to your anti-clockwise moments, right? So, if you have been using this principle at the previous example just now, you will have been able to find that the value here to be 9.5 Newton. Now, the second condition that it needs to satisfy is that there is no, okay, there is no net or resultant force, right? So, if there's no net or resultant force, that means that your total um, resultant force is zero. So, your total upward forces... Your total upward forces must be equal to your total downward forces. Okay, total downward forces. Okay, so what are your total upward forces? Total upward forces is only your R. And your total downward force will be the 6 Newton plus 4 Newton plus your 9.5 Newton. So essentially, your R will give you a value of 19.5 Newton. Okay, so at the next portion over here, it shows a diagram. And the diagram actually shows a weighing scale used by the ancient Chinese to actually measure math, right? So if you actually have gone to those um, Chinese medicine shop, those traditional medicine shop, you will be able to see the uncle or the sensei, okay, using this device over here, right? Using this device over here to actually measure the mass of the medicine, right? Uh, before dispensing it to you. So this scale actually uses the same principle as the principle of moments. Alright, so um, how it works is that is this uncle will actually be holding on to the string. So the string actually um, acts as the pivot. Okay, and then on the left and right, okay, one of it will be your standard mass. Okay, at the other end will be the load. Alright, and then by adjusting the standard mass left and right, you will be actually be able to measure the mass of the product that you are trying to measure. Alright, so it brings us to the next part of the topic, okay, when we want to see how is it that a beam balance is able to measure mass, right? So in the previous chapter, okay, in mass weight density, we say that a beam balance is used to measure mass, right? So it's actually based on using the principle of moment. So a beam balance essentially looks something like that. You have a pivot and then you will have a beam. So on the right hand side you will have your standard mass and on the left hand side you will be you will have mass of the item that you want to measure. So if you use the principle of moment, the anti-clockwise moment is equal to your clockwise moment, right? So your clockwise moment will be due to your standard mass over here and the apple will give you the anti-clockwise moment, right? So um, to find for the anti-clockwise moment, okay, you need to use force multiplied by distance, right? And we know that the force acting on the apple over here is referring to the weight of the apple. And how do we find the weight of the apple? Remember that the weight of the apple can be found by taking W equals to mass times gravitational field strength, right? Which is essentially this part over here. So M times G will be your force. Okay, this will be your force. Multiply by this distance to the pivot will be equal to 3S times G. Right? So what does 3S times G refer to? Um, we are saying that on the right hand side over here, S over here will refer to the mass of your standard weight. Right? So mass of your standard weight. And so, if you have to use three of these masses, okay, if you have to use three of these masses, then the weight will be equal to three of the standard masses multiplied by the mass. And this will give you the mass of your total um, weights over here, right? Your total mass multiplied by your gravitational field strength, right? So, that's how you will get your 3SG times D. And therefore, your mass will be equal to 3s because when you um, divide or you cancel out the distance, you cancel out the gravitational field strength, and then you see that the mass is equal to 3s, right? So now we know why is it that the beam balance can be used in other parts, right? It is used to measure mass because you see that the mass 
is actually equals to the mass of the standard masses over here. Right? So even if you place this whole apparatus with all the apples and standard masses on the moon, for example, the gravitational field strength on the left and right side of the equation will cancel out. And therefore, you will get the mass to be equal to the mass of your standard masses. Right? And so that is why we use the beam balance to actually measure mass. And therefore, it is not right okay, to use a spring balance or to use... Uh, other devices to measure your mass, right? Okay, what about if let's say the apple and your standard methods are not placed at the same distance from the pivot? Can you still use this device? So the answer is yes, all right? So you still apply your principle of moment. Okay, anti-clockwise moment of apple is equal to clockwise moment of your standard mass. And therefore, when you calculate your standard mass, you will be able to get um, the value of your um, the value of your apples, right? Okay, so um, I am not going to go through this um, whole example with you. Okay, this is just to give you a rough idea. Okay, of how the beam balance is actually used, um, how it actually uses the principle of moment to actually find the mass of the object. All right. Okay, so we've uh, so-called um, end this segment on the principle of moments. Okay, I hope it's been clear. If it's not, okay, you can always uh, get back to us and then we will try our best to um, explain to you again. Right, so take care.